You're listening to EdTech Heroes, a podcast that looks at how teachers in today's classrooms can use technology to improve student learning. In each episode, a hero in the world of education will share their story and discuss how innovation can influence the minds of the next generation. Let's jump in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to EdTech Heroes. I'm your host, Neff, and today's guest is Eric Kurtz. Eric has been in education for 26 years and currently serves as a technology integration specialist for Spark Portage Area Computer Consortium in Canton, Ohio. Eric is also the author of Control All Achieve and is a Google for Education trainer and innovator. He provides training throughout Ohio and across the country. And he was also recently named one of EdTech Magazine's top 30 K through 12 IT influencers for 2022. Eric, welcome to EdTech Heroes. Well, hey, thank you so much for having <laughs> me. I really appreciate that. The only adjustment I'll make is an unfortunate one in that it's not been 26 years. It's now been 30 years that I've been in education. <laughs> so I'm four years older than un unfortunately that more flattering bio had been. <laughs> but no, that everything other than that, Absolutely accurate. Just a little bit older. That's even better. Four extra years of wisdom that you can impart on listeners. There you go. <laughs> that's that's the way we're gonna look at it. That's exactly right. <laughs> four more four more years of experience. Yeah. And I know that there is another thing actually while we're talking about your bio that wasn't included. You have done so much that it was hard for us to bring that down to just a couple of sentences. You also lead the Google Educator Group in Ohio, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Now, GEGs or Google Educator Groups have been around for a long time. I, I'd have to kind of go back now and see when they were kicked off. But the way I know they've been around for a long time is when they were first launched, Google basically asked, hey, you know, would some of the trainers, innovators, people like that, grassroots people launch these local Google Educator Groups and we want and you to use Google Plus Communities uh, to host them. So this was back when Google plus communities were the way that this was to be uh, hosted. And that's what we had. We started off the Google plus community. And so of course, over the years, you know, that's evolved quite a lot. And so, yeah, I absolutely would encourage people to look for your GEG in your mm -hmm. state, country, wherever you might be. If you were just to Google, you know, that term, you know, Google educator group near me or something like that, you probably would be able to find that site that Google provides where you can connect with them. Having said that though, even though I do the one for the state of Ohio, we're open to anybody. I mean, hmm. yeah, sure. We focus on Ohio in that there'll be a portion of our meetings where we're talking about maybe some upcoming conferences that are more local, but so much of what gets shared doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter where you're yeah. from. It's all virtual content. And so what we do is we meet once a month, usually the last Thursday of the month. So like this, as of this recording, this Thursday coming up is going to be our next meeting. And they're usually two hours long and they're online. So we broadcast them over YouTube. People can watch them live. They can jump in the chat. There's an agenda document they can type in with everybody else. It's all wide open. And we cover everything new in Google from the last month. And then we also cover what we call show and tell, cool things mm. that we've come across. And we do Q&A. We take questions from everybody and it's fantastic. So everybody is absolutely welcome. There's four of us who help run that. The panel each month kind of switches in and out depending upon who's available. I'm, I'm usually the, the one who's always there for sure, but then I may have a, a different guest um, each month depending upon who's available to join me in with that. If people want to get to that, they can go to bit.ly slash GEG Ohio, and that'll get them to our website where they can see all the recordings of the previous ones and the upcoming ones as well. Yeah. Super awesome. I didn't know that anybody could come in, whether they were in Ohio native or not, but that is super cool to know. We don't, yeah, we don't check. We don't check any kind of uh, <laughs> proof of where, where you live. No, typically we'll have international folks joining us oh, wow. as well. Usually the first thing we do when we start off the meetings is like, welcome everybody and say, Hey, throw, throw in the chat where you're from. And we'll get folks that are international as well. And, you know, it did get from month to month. It depends, but you know, 
we'll have between 50 and 100 people joining us live, you know, during those sessions. So mm -hmm. it's also a really great time to ask questions and get help from other people who might have expertise in those areas. So, hey, gates are wide open. Come on in, <laughs> anybody who wants to join us for those sessions. Very cool. Very cool. We'll certainly yeah. make sure to put that information down in the show notes for anybody who might be looking to join the next GEG Ohio meeting. But I want to yes. talk a little bit about this new piece of designation that you have as this top 30 ed tech influencer. <laughs> what does that feel like to have been put on that list? Oh, I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, it mm. absolutely is. I mean, I'm very, very humbled and honored and excited by that. So I absolutely want to give a, a big thanks to EdTech Magazine for including me in that. It's surreal at the same time because just a dude, you know, sitting in my office here, putting out some content now and then, you know, and that's something that I think it's an important thing to say, like if I go to conferences and, you know, I'll come, I'll meet somebody and sometimes folks may know me from Twitter or for something like that. They're like, you know, oh my gosh, you know, it's so cool to meet you. And it's like, it's just me and <laughs> I want to know about you. And so one of the first things I always try to do when I meet folks is you know, turn it around right away and tell me about you. What do you do? I want to learn from you because and I think that's what's so important is we can't be in a situation where we review anybody above somebody else because then okay. the learning can't happen. If I'm doing a presentation, I want to learn from the audience. I want to walk away with something new I didn't know. And if I'm not, then I'm not engaging with people and I'm not being a lifelong learner as well. I think it's so important to realize we're all learners. We're all educators. Sure. We're all just folks figuring this out as we go. Having said that, wow, there's some amazing people on that list. And so again, I, I, I feel really fortunate that, you know, whatever I'm sharing is content that somebody felt was worthy enough to call attention to. But I was so excited to see friends like, you know, Ben Cogswell's on there and then Jen Hall, love mm -hmm. Jen, oh my gosh. And then Stephanie Howell, my GEG Ohio co-leader is on the list and Monica Burns and so many people that I've known for years that are amazing. Mm -hmm. But there's folks on the list that I really was not that familiar with. And so I went in and I just followed every single person on there going, hey, if you got designated, you're somebody I need to be connecting with. And so I'm excited to learn from all these other folks on the list that I, I didn't know very well. And now it's opened up a whole new opportunity for me to connect with folks. Yeah, certainly. And I think both myself and everybody listening really appreciates the humility in I'm just a guy, right? And I think oh, that yeah. collectively... We have had lots of conversations about what it means to be an influencer, not just in education, but throughout our lives. We have influencers asking us to buy toothpaste, asking us to engage in one thing or another. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts when we think about ed tech influencers. What code of conduct do you live by and what role do you play in the education space? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So if I'm an influencer in anything, I, I guess some of the things that are important to me, one is I'm all about freely sharing ideas with others. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong. We all got to make a living. We all have to pay the bills and that's phenomenal. And I'm not going to ever get upset at somebody because they need to pay the bills. Right? I have to pay them as well. But a really important key thing for me is whenever possible, you know, freely share things because I guarantee you there's nothing I've ever created that I wasn't somehow inspired by somebody else. It's not like I created this out of the void. I didn't make mm -hmm. these things up myself. Maybe I saw somebody do a cool thing, but that's so neat. Here's a twist I could do on that, you know? And so, you know, anything that I have, I want to put out there so that people can use it and then they can modify and do stuff with it. So I release all my stuff okay. under a Creative Commons license. All I ask for is that, hey, if I give it away free and you change it, you need to give it away free too. <laughs> and well, please leave a link back to where you found it at. You know, so like, I mean, years and years ago when I did my build a snowman activity and Google Slides, you know, that's something I could have said, you know, this is really cute and really cool. I'm going to put this, you know, behind a paywall or something. Mm. And if you want to get to it, 
And that would have been fine. You know, I probably would have, you know, sold, you know, hundreds of copies of it. But instead, hundreds of thousands of children have gotten to do that activity and go home from school and be like, I did this really cool thing in school today, you know? And then people took that activity and they modified it. Had somebody from, I don't know, somewhere in the Southwest say, Hey, I made a ver we don't get snow. So I made a version with tumbleweeds instead. <laughs> Fantastic. Build upon those things, you know? So, you know, I, I think that's something that I try to encourage people to do is share and don't worry if, if you think, well, it's not good enough. No, 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 no. Get it out there. You know, take the stuff you've created, get it out there, share it with others. Done is better than perfect. You know, mm. don't be comparing and worrying about that. Somebody is going to be inspired by what it is you're sharing and they're going to connect with that and be like, oh, this is so cool. I can use this or I can modify this. So, you know, as an influencer, I don't know if I can use that term. <laughs> if if I have any kind of influence, one thing I hope that influence includes is encouraging people to share their ideas and to share them freely with others because we're all better together. We all can build upon each other and take what they've got and run with it. I mean, I'll get an email from somebody. I just had one recently, somebody saying, hey, is it okay if I use your hipster Google presentation because I wanna modify it and do it at a local thing? And I'm like, of course, please take it and modify it and use it. Mm. That's great. You know, that's something that I do try to live by and encourage. So I guess that's one piece of it. Yeah, I love it. And I, I have to admit that I have used the snowman activity in Google Slides. Um, so right. <laughs> it's pretty cool to think about how freely information is shared. Even your example a few minutes ago in terms of international folks showing up to the GEG Ohio meeting or hundreds of thousands of children throughout the world really engaging in a similar activity, but having a unique spin by the teacher that created it is awesome. Right. And that happens as a result of technology, but it also happens as a result of free access to those activities and free access to that technology. So I so appreciate that call out. I, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the tools that might be helpful for folks. And I know you do a ton of this stuff on Control All Achieve. You've got a guide for using Google Classroom, a guide for using Google Sheets. I think I saw something on there about using Moat as well relatively recently. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. am curious to know from one of the ed tech experts, what are some of the tools that teachers need to be as effective as possible in the classroom? Well, I mean, that is a tough question. I, I, I'll probably answer it in kind of some strange ways. One thing is we need a mindset about the tools that we have because okay. I work at a county office. So I work with 35 school districts during my day job. So mm -hmm. my day job is I'm a technology integration. So for those who don't know, I was a teacher. I taught middle school math for seven years. In the last 23 years, I've been a tech coach, a tech integrationist. So I work at a regional service center, the county office up here in Northeast Ohio, and I support about 35 districts and they're all different. You know, we've got districts that have, you know, good funding and we have districts that are struggling on tight budgets. We have districts with large populations, small populations. We've got urban, suburban, rural, we've got all kinds of stuff. And so not every school is going to be able to get the same tools as every other school. And if mm. suddenly we say, well, we just can't do it then, I guess, you know, if I, if I can't have the tool that district XYZ has, I guess our kids just can't do that thing. When I was coming up through the tech world, after I had taught for seven years, I worked at a district before coming to the county office. And we got hit with a lot of budget issues. I, I worked for, for North Canton City Schools, an amazing mm -hmm. school district. And we were the home of Hoover Appliances. That was what we were known for. Well, Hoover Appliances left. They moved out of the country and it just decimated the tax base in that city. And there was a mm. period of time, again, district is amazing. They're doing phenomenal now, but there was a district of time or time, a period of time we had to rebound from that. And we just didn't have 
a lot of money for stuff. And so this is what I'm kind of coming around to is the philosophy of what is, you know, what is a tool, you know, when it comes to technology and do you have to have a certain tool that has a certain name or price tag on it? And for a long time, we didn't have money. And so it was like, okay, how can we use the tools we have in creative ways? You know, mm -hmm. I loved the show, the M MacGyver show. I don't know if you, uh -huh. uh, I yeah. don't know how far back MacGyver goes. MacGyver is like, 80s maybe late 80s mid 80s i'm sorry i'm drawing a blank as to when it was i was a kid and i loved macgyver so it must have been in the 80s probably but the idea that he wouldn't be in a situation and say well the only way to get out of this is i have to have this exact make and model government issued device that is going to solve mm -hmm. this thing he goes nope okay i'm going to grab this thing and this thing i'm going to repurpose them and use them in creative ways to be able to solve this and so that's what i started doing a lot when I was at North Canton and Google became a big piece of that because at that time it was Google apps and then G suite and Google workspace. But back then it was Google apps and it was free, you know, and it, the core still is, it's like, okay, let's take this tool that we do have and let's think, how can we use it creatively? And, and I think that mindset is really so important for schools. It's not that I have to have this tool. It's that, okay, what tools do we have and how can we use them in creative ways? You know, we talked about the build a snowman thing. Well, mm. that's a Google slides activity. Google slides was developed as a presentation tool, but it doesn't have to be just a presentation tool. It can be a drag and drop manipulative creative tool like that, mm -hmm. or you can make stop motion animation with it, or you can do choose your own adventure stories with branching options. And it can be so much more. And I think teachers are wonderful about that, about you build something for us and we're going to find 20 other ways to use it than you intended it to be built for. I mean, Google just released the new uh, drop down chips feature in Docs. It came out like, I don't know, a month ago, a couple of weeks ago, where now in Docs, you can have a little drop down mm -hmm. uh, uh, menu inside of your doc. And Google, of course, when they roll this out and all of their articles are talking about using this for project management and every example they show is this drop down chip with started, completed in process. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. But I'm like, this would be great for closed reading activities. You know, let's <laughs> take a text and let's pull out certain words and let's put in a drop down from a word bank and have kids do close C L O Z E close reading activities in there. And it's like, okay, they didn't build this tool for that but we can use it for that, you know? Sure. And so I guess that's something I would certainly encourage people to consider is, yes, I, God, I wish every school had the funding they deserved. Every school, every child, every teacher. I wish that was the case. At the same time, if this is the reality we're living in and we've only got certain budgets and we've got restrictions, I'm going to do my best. One of my missions is to do my best to provide people with ideas on how to accomplish as much amazing stuff as they can for free or at very low cost with the tools that we have. So I try to shine a light on using what's at our hands in creative ways, whether it is the Microsoft suite or the Google suite or Screencastify or it's Moat or whatever the tool is, how can mm -hmm. we use it in as many interesting ways as possible? I, I love that answer, and I especially love the reference to MacGyver. You might not know this, yeah. but they have rebooted it. So for anybody yeah, who is I looking for that. Yeah. okay, all right, uh, <laughs> maybe we'll have to talk about how it compares to the MacGyver of your childhood. But... I have not seen. I have not seen the new <laughs> version. Yeah. Okay, for those of you who have seen the old version, and you know what, I've never seen the old version, but I have seen the new version. But same rules apply where he is able to make something happen out of seemingly nothing. And I right. really, really love that analogy for classrooms. And for lots of folks, they are given very little to work with. And that's unfair and it sucks. And we can certainly have a conversation yes. about that problem in education. But I think right. for lots of teachers, it becomes an opportunity to be able to turn that into still authentic, engaging learning experiences for their kids. And those types of experiences often are not reliant on a specific tool. They're more so reliant on the imagination of the educator. So I appreciate you calling that out. Yeah.
Well, I get so yeah. I know I kind kind of dodged the question a little bit, <laughs> but but no, that that is definitely a philosophy I I, I live by, and you know, um, trying to help schools wherever they're at. So when you go on my my blog, most of the time you're going to see tools that are either free or that have a free version because mm -hmm. I want to make sure if I'm taking the time to develop an activity or share something, there's an option for everybody to use mm -hmm. it. And hey, if there's a paid version, fantastic. Do that as well. And if you, if you love that tool and get some more bells and whistles with it, but here's something everybody can do. We're not going to, you know, push anybody to the side. Everybody can, can use these tools for these activities. Yeah. Certainly, certainly. I, I am with you there. And I've heard you talk a little bit about video as being one of these Swiss mm -hmm. army knife tools where you yep. can do a lot of things with just a webcam or with just a screen recorder. Can you talk a little bit about how video plays a role in the classroom and some of the innovative uses of video from where you sit? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there are so many uh, wonderful ways to use video. I mean, sure, first of all, we've got some of just the the more common approaches, like in my day to day, you know, life. I, I use video to provide tech support for folks. Mm -hmm. If I get an email from somebody and they're asking how to do something. I'll be about half a sentence into typing the email and I'll go, this is not an email. This is a video, you know, and I do, I've got Screencastify sitting right up in the top corner there. I, I'm not making that up. Honest to God, it's right there. And I, <laughs> I click it and I'm like, okay, you know, I say, Hey, I got your email and here I'll, I'll take it. And I, and I just pull up and I take them through and I explain everything in the video. And once it's done, I grab the link, throw it to the email, zip it off to them. That is phenomenal because it's way faster for me than typing everything up. It's very personalized and mm -hmm. they can just watch the video and see all that, you know, and of course I use videos for, you know, instruction uh, on their own. So anytime I do a blog post, I try to make a video with it that explains it because everybody learns differently. Some people want to read my blog post. Some people want to watch the video that goes with it. And of course I try to record my trainings so people can watch mm -hmm. them again later. But as far as, you know, when we start getting away from some of the, the standard things, instructional videos and things like that, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. There was a post a long time ago I'd put on, and I've heard, you know, teachers say that they've used this where you use Screencastify, for example, to dub videos. So Ooh. here's the idea. What you do is a student will find a video like on YouTube or whatever, mm -hmm. and what they'll do is they'll mute the video. They'll hit play, they'll hit record, and basically they're recording the video while they are speaking, you know, over it. And so mm. it's like, maybe it's a nature video and they are doing their own commentary on it. Or, you know, it's really any video that covers any topic related to their class, but they're providing their own voice over for it. And then, you know, using that to ex express their understanding in that concept, you know, and so there you're using a screen recorder. Mm -hmm. with an existing video, but you're adding your own, the students are bringing their own understanding to it. Or maybe it's that they're translating it into a different language, or maybe they're taking a scene from Romeo and Juliet and they're modernizing it with modern dialogue, you know, but the mm -hmm. point is they're taking an existing video and recording their voice while that video is muted and doing a dubbing activity over it. That's, that's a neat thing. I, another one that I've shared in the past is what I call video mashups, where basically in Google Slides, when you add a video to Google Slides, you can set the settings so that it plays automatically. You can also mm -hmm. set the settings so that it plays at a certain time. Like, oh, this one starts at 32 seconds in or whatever. And so there's an activity I've encouraged people to do where they'll take a, a, a video and then find maybe a video of a song that they think goes with that, whether it's, you know, again, a science video, a historical video, whatever it is, they find a song they think goes with it and they put both of the videos on a, on a slide and then they queue them up. So they start at the right places. <laughs> and then when the video, when the slideshow plays, they've added this, you know, it, this, this song to it. They've done a video mashup. They play mm -hmm. at the same time. And then the next slide, the student explains why. Why did you decide, why does this song go with this video? What was your thought behind it? Where are the connections in, in there? So, you know, 
those are some examples that I, I think are a little, you know, different than just what we normally think of with video, which goes back to what we've been saying all along. It's all about looking at a tool and kind of looking at it from an angle and going, how else could we use this? What else could we do with this than what we traditionally have been doing with it? Those are both amazing examples. And what I like about what you've posited is that they are examples that could be used across grade levels, across subjects, right? When you're talking about that dubbing right. example, we've got foreign language students. I would have loved to get my ELA students on top of a dubbing video for their own interpretation of a main character in a novel, right? Yeah. So, so these ideas are so multifaceted. And to your point, we get to iterate on them and make them makes sense for the learners that we have in front of us with perhaps the same tool that is a free tool, right? And the other thing that's really dope about it is that we also have these opportunities for students to not just be consumers of videos, but to be creators of videos as well. And that's where a lot of the learning happens, where they get to express their ideas in new and novel ways. Oh, absolutely. That, that is, yeah, so important. We talk about, you know, student voice and uh, mm -hmm. how about, you know, actually having their voice <laughs> being a part of it when we talk about student voice. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and I do love how video is becoming a lot more readily available, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Screencastify, whether it's the Google Classroom mobile app, whether it's Flipgrid, whatever the case, that we're reducing the friction, that it's just so easy to record a video, you know, very quickly. In the past, you know, you, you thought about the video and it was like, uh, there was a, a hurdle. There was a quite, sure. quite a barrier to entry. You needed you know, a certain type of computer and you needed this software and you needed a special this and a special that. And it's just not, you know, right from our phone or right from our Chromebook or right from, you know, what our webcam students can very easily record themselves because I mean, that's a whole other thing. Just having students record themselves to respond to a question in class rather than saying, okay, we want you to write a paragraph response. No, you know, let's let the students answer it themselves, you know, and in this, there's so many permutations to this. It could be, for example, I mentioned the Google classroom mobile app that has video built right into it. So if a student is on their Chromebook running the mobile app or a phone, they could just boom, hit the video button, record themselves and just submit that right with their assignment. Or if it's like, you know, having all the students together in a Google slideshow and each student is dropping a video on their slide of them explaining, how did you solve this math problem or defining the science term in their own words? And, you know, maybe they're just using Screencastify to record it and then boom, throwing it right in there from their drive. What I love about all that is it's, yeah, it's giving the students voice. It's letting mm -hmm. them express something themselves, not just typing it up, which also I think this goes a long way, I think, to helping teachers deal with some of the concerns about academic integrity. Mm -hmm. If you're worried about a student copying and pasting an answer, well, you know, let them explain things in their own words on a video. Yeah, I guess we can always find a way around things, but still that's going to move us, I think, closer to, well, you're not just copying and pasting something. You know, at this point now you are at least expressing it yourself. And you know, as a math teacher, rather than having a student do a worksheet with, you know, 24 problems on how to solve two-step equations, I'd much rather see a video where they solve two equations and they talk me through step-by-step step what they're doing each step of the way as they're recording what's on the screen and they're explaining what they did because now I'm seeing the process. And if there's a problem, we're realizing what that problem is. For sure, for sure. I hadn't thought of the academic integrity angle, but as you say it, it makes so much sense. But as you were talking and spoke a little bit about how video is so readily accessible, my mind goes to how that is also true in the broader world that we live in, right? So when I was a kid and I was doing light HTML to create my MySpace page, the idea of a video existing on that MySpace page was so foreign, right? But now I can log on to TikTok and espouse my ideas about whatever the heck I want, whether people want to hear about it mm -hmm. or not. 
But what's interesting about that is if we think of our classrooms as microcosms of the bigger world, there's also this really intense conversation happening on TikTok about integrity, right? About giving credit back to creators when they actually create something, about making sure that trends are original to the person who is going to profit off of them. So it's always interesting when we have these conversations in education, and they are so, so, so similar to the conversations that are happening outside of education. And it's a, it's a conversation we should be having because we mm -hmm. talk about digital literacy. And I know, you know, in the past, sometimes there have been teachers or schools who've been concerned about, well, you know, we don't want our students doing things in class where they're posting online or sharing things online. It's like, well, hold on. Okay. Maybe we create, maybe not, but maybe, maybe we create a safer environment in which they can do that. Maybe they're just posting inside of Google Classroom. Maybe mm -hmm. we find a safer spot for them, but we allow them to wrestle with these issues because this is what they're going to be dealing with in the real world. Would it be better if we allowed these sticky topics to come up in a classroom where if a student does plagiarize something or they do say something that's inappropriate, it's not out on the entire internet for everybody to see, but we can address it within our 25 mm -hmm. students in our classroom and say, okay, let's talk about this as to, you know, how to conduct ourselves properly in an online environment. So yeah, I, you know, absolutely. I think that's a, a great thing. We don't want to shy away from. We certainly want to do that sort of instruction with our mm -hmm. students so that we are preparing them for the world that they're not just heading into the world they're in right now. I mean, you know, uh, they're, they're just going to grab their phone and have total access to all this sure. stuff. Uh, let's have the classroom be a safe environment to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. For sure. And I, yeah, I love the classroom as a testing ground. In reality, that is what education is supposed to be. So as we get closer and closer to having conversations that don't feel like they're in isolation, to me, that's, that's the time when we start to pat ourselves on the back and realize that we are creating these authentic learning experiences that students can take with them. And we can kind of get a little bit farther from that age old question of, when am I ever going to use this, Miss Dukes or Mr. Kurtz, right? Um, yeah. So so I love that. I know that we are recording this episode as we approach the summer. And you have shared some amazing ideas. But I want to ask you specifically about the summer. What are some ways that you can share with teachers to keep students engaged and exercising their minds during the summer months? Oh, that's a tough one because on one hand, I, I hate the idea of being like, okay, we're going to give you an assignment over mm -hmm. the summer. You know, it's like, you know, I, I would never want to be that teacher or like, okay, here's, here's your, here's your summer assignment. But the idea of engaging their minds and having them still continue to learn is a wonderful thing. What I would tie it to, I would think about it like, um, so Google does their, their 20% time, which if people Absolutely. aren't familiar with the idea is at schools, we all have times we call it genius hour or, or, or mm -hmm. something like that. But Google initially called it 20% time. The idea that if there's an employee there, uh, 80% of their time is devoted to what they've been assigned to do 20% or basically one day a week. They can work on anything as long as it's for the greater good and, and it, you know, ties into at least, you know, moving things forward with the big mission. Hey, whatever you're passionate about, work on it. And so mm -hmm. amazing things have come out of Google because of 20% time where somebody has taken an interesting idea and run with it and developed an entire product that came out of it. I do a, a whole session, my hipster Google session, which is all about lesser known Google tools. And a lot of those came from those kind of things. I guess what I'm getting back to is about students. We don't ever seem to have enough time. And I, I see kids just packed to the gills, trying to do everything, to try to fit everything in during a regular school week from mm -hmm. their assignments, their extracurriculars, just life. It's so busy using the summer as 20% time and saying, what are you passionate about? 
Mm -hmm. What are you excited about? Dive into that. If it's reading books about it, great. If it's watching videos about it, great. If it's listening to podcasts about it, that's great. Consume information about something that a teacher didn't tell you to do. It's not on the required reading list. It's not, you're not being told to do this. Maybe you want to learn to juggle. Awesome. Go on YouTube and learn how to juggle. Maybe you're just fascinated with, you know, birds. I say that because right outside my window, I've got two bird feeders. And during COVID, that was one of the things that I became obsessed with was learning all about <laughs> birds, you know? And so, you know, I know all kinds of Ohio birds now, but you know, the idea is I would encourage anything we could do to encourage students to pursue something that they are excited about. Does mm -hmm. not matter if the teacher thinks it's important. It does not matter if the curriculum thinks it's important. Learning is learning and a mm -hmm. love of learning. I hate to see a love of learning get squashed by saying, you know, let's fit it into a mold and say, okay, you've got to accomplish, you know, these things. I still love to learn new things. After 30 years in education, I'm constantly wanting to learn new stuff. And I get it a lot of ways. Sometimes it's reading, but a lot of times you talk about video. YouTube, I mean, I'm scared to see the statistics on how many hours I of YouTube <laughs> videos I have viewed, you know, but that's how I learn stuff. Mm -hmm. It's amazing amazing the content that's out there and so i uh, you know now could we ask students to have some some sort of you know at the end of the summer or part way through that they record a video and explain here's something i learned you know this was the thing i got excited about sure i think that's cool to have some you know if we can have some kind of expectation that they're going to now share but the thing is there can't be like a right and wrong to it it's got to be like sure. okay this is what you got excited about and you just went down that rabbit hole. Awesome. That's a kind of, I would love to encourage that in everybody, you know, go down the rabbit holes, find the thing you're passionate about and learn about it, whatever it is. And then tell us about it, share, mm -hmm. share what you learned and why you got excited about it. You know, I think there've been studies done that, you know, talk about, you know, the value of recreational reading versus like homework, you know, that students who were not given homework, but did recreational reading, the impact, the positive impact that had on them. Well, I would extend recreational reading to any kind of consuming, whether it's audiobooks, whether it's videos, whatever the case might be. So that would be something I would probably shout out for would be that i'm shouting out for it too and what i love about the activity is that it gives students agency which is incredibly important but it also hides this exercise of having students come to real conclusions about how they learn right so if a kid comes back to me and tells me that they learned everything there is to know about fortnite and my follow-up question is, how did you learn it? And they say, well, I looked at forums. That tells me something that is a little bit different than the kid who learned everything there is to know about Fortnite, but they learned it all through watching screen recordings on YouTube, right? So that right. is valuable information that we as educators can use to dictate the next school year, but it still gives students that opportunity to engage in learning, to explore their passions, to have a summer, right? Like we don't want yes. the summer to be bogged down by this packet and that packet, um, but we can still get to this idea of students learning, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Love it. So I love that you've joined us. And before we let you off the hook, we've got one <laughs> final question. So, All right. Aside from your blog, which is amazing, controlaltachieve.com, what are some of your favorite online resources to share with teachers if perhaps they want to go down a rabbit hole this summer? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So one thing that, that is most valuable to me is blogs. There's one there's I love podcasts. I love YouTube videos. I love all this stuff. But I also really love, love blogs and people who are willing to share things on blogs. 
And there's a lot of amazing educators who do that. So over the years, I have periodically updated a post that I have where I try to share out my list of what are the ed tech blogs that I follow. Mm -hmm. Now, people can get to this list on my site. I think at the moment it's bit.ly slash 75 ed tech blogs with the number seven, five, not okay. spelled out, but just the number. So bit.ly slash seven, five ed tech blogs. That'll take people to the most recent iteration of this list. And these are people who all deserve to be bringing this full circle. They all deserve to be on that K-12 IT influencers list because they've all mm. influenced me and they're amazing people. And some of them are well-known names. When you look down that list, you're going to see the Matt Millers and the Casey Bells, and you're going to see people like that, but you're going to see other people too, who maybe, you know, have Twitter followers in the hundreds rather than mm -hmm. the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, but they put out amazing content and amazing ideas. And so when people look at this and they go 75 blogs, Eric, how am I going to check 75 blogs? Well, I don't check 75 blogs, I use a tool called Readly or excuse me, Feedly. <laughs> I, I, it used to be Google Reader and I still miss it. So, so here I am <laughs> still calling it that. So it's Feedly, which is, was what I used to replace Google Reader. So Feedly, it's free. There, there's a paid version if you want, but the free version, I think lets you go up to a hundred, I think a hundred blogs can be pulled into it. And so oh. at Feedly.com, what you do is you go there, you hit the little plus button and you throw in a link to a blog you like. And it, and it pulls it in, it adds it in. And so when I go, I'll go to Feedly every couple of days and it will pull in all the new blog posts from every single blog I am subscribed to through Feedly. And so in hmm. one spot, I can just go to one spot and go click, 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 click. And I can look through all of the new posts that have been. So basically it's bringing all 75 of well, sure. the 75 on mine, but it's bringing all hundred or whatever of those all in one place. And so. I would encourage people to check out that post that I've got there, look down through there, start exploring some of those blogs. And if this is something that works for you, and if it doesn't hate, hey, that's cool. Everybody learns in their own way. But if this does work for you, I would encourage you to try out Feedly, start adding those, mm -hmm. you know, those blogs into there. And then, you know, once a week, you know, head over to Feedly and see, okay, what's new. And now you could just go down the list and be like, okay, I found, you know, a dozen really awesome posts out of the, you know, 60 that were on here. These, you know, five, 10 posts really resonated with me. I'm now going to dive into those a little bit further. So that would be a place that not only are you going to learn great things, but you're going to connect with amazing people. These are good people you need to have in your life. These are people who are taking that step. They're putting stuff out there. They're sharing. And so these are folks that you want to be connected with. Certainly. I know what I'm doing after this. Feedly sounds awesome. And more than anything, it's not necessarily about the tool, but about being able to aggregate really good ideas. So I yeah. am so excited about putting that on my to-do list and starting to explore. Eric, I so appreciate you joining EdTech Heroes. If you are listening to this, be sure to start by following Eric on Twitter at Eric Kurtz and visit controlaltachieve.com for a ton of resources that any educator can benefit from and learn how you can work with Eric. I am your host, Neff Dukes, and I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of EdTech Heroes, presented by Screencastify.